Here's just a, a quicker reteach video for section 4.4, which is graphing sinusoids, so sine and cosine, and transforming those graphs um, on an xy plane. So first things first, let's just talk about the sine function. Um, we know some of the values of sine of x if we look at a unit circle, sine of 0. Remember, sine is the second coordinate in the coordinate pair, so sine of 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 6, um, pi over 6 is one of the uh, angle values that I know in the first quadrant, that's 30 degrees, and we know that the sine of 30 degrees is a half. And then we get sine of pi over 2, that's 90 degrees, based on the unit circle, sine of 90 degrees is 1, it's the second coordinate. Sine of pi over six, or five pi over six, again, that's in the third or quadrant, so it'd be somewhere right there. But we can use the reference angle of 30 degrees, or pi over six, and take the sine of that. And in the second quadrant, sine is positive, so it's still a half. At pi, if you follow around the circle, um, the second coordinate is zero, again. Seven pi over six is the third quadrant, and in the third quadrant, sine is negative then we'd have negative 1. And then the fourth quadrant, sine is negative, and the reference angle is still 30. And at 2 pi, we're back to the same place, which is 0. I guess I didn't write in these coordinates. So this is 0, comma, negative 1. So the second coordinate is negative 1. And this is 1, comma, 0. Okay. Again, remember, I know the signs from ASTC. I know that only in quadrant 1 and quadrant 2, that sign is going to be positive. And it's nice that we know the unit circle, because now we can graph this. We have 0, and then a half, 1, a half, 0, negative a half, negative 1, negative a half, 0. So if we look, oh, I started erasing. I meant to be highlighting. This is called a sine wave. It is one period of a sine wave because after this, the wave would start repeating itself. So this section right here is called a period. Now the sine curve, if we drew it on for forever, so I'm gonna give this side arrows and this side arrows, just pretend like this is going on forever. It does have some qualities that we can talk about. Uh, probably the most important one we can talk about is that the start of this function is at 0, 0. That's going to be super helpful to tell the difference between it and the cosine curve. Its maximum values occur at pi over 2. That's how high it gets. So pi over 2 plus 2k pi. What that means is that it's going to happen here, but then also because this wave keeps going, there's going to be another maximum here. And that would be 2 pi more than this value. So 2 pi, sorry, pi over 2, and then every 2 pi after that, there will be another maximum at 1, which is why we have this coordinate. Same thing for the minimum. The minimum value is negative 1, and it occurs at 3 pi over 2, and then every repetition of this as the periods repeat. So that's where the 2k pi comes from. Or you might see that written as 2 pi k. Those are kind of, doesn't really matter what order you write them. The zeros of this function, remember zeros are x-intercepts, so it occurs at 0, pi, and 2 pi, and continues to continue or show up at every pi after that. So we'd have pi, 2 pi, 3 pi it would cross again, 4 pi it would cross again, so there's a general solution. This period, or this one curve, ends at 2 pi comma 0. The domain of the extended function as it goes on is all real numbers from negative infinity to infinity, and its range is from negative 1 to 1. It has an odd symmetry. Remember, odd is symmetrical about the origin, so if I put a little pin mark right here and rotated the graph around the origin, it would land right on top of itself. And it is bounded above and below, which means it's just bounded because it has a lowest and a highest local maximum. Let's do the same thing for sine. I'll start off by drawing the unit circle here where we have the coordinate 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. Now remember, cosine is the first coordinate around the unit circle. So that means the cosine of 0 degrees is 1. 
If we remember um, the quadrant one, cosine of one over three, or cosine of 60 degrees, is one half. Cosine of pi over two is zero. Cosine of two pi over three in the second quadrant, well, that's gonna be a negative value because cosine is negative in the second quadrant. Pi, the first coordinate, is negative one. We're gonna have negative one half, and you can kind of see what's happening in the pattern. We're gonna reach back to zero, then to a half, and all the way back to one, finishing off one wave or one period of the cosine function. So instead of starting at the origin, this function starts at one, but then it kind of follows the same pattern as the sine function, going up, coming back, or going down, coming back up, and then going back down again if we were to continue. But this is one period between zero and two pi of the cosine function. Let's do the same thing and let's talk about the um, attributes of the cosine function. Importantly, cosine starts at 0, 1. That's the biggest way, again, to tell the difference between sine and cosine. These functions have a maximum at 0, 2 pi k or 2 k pi, 1. So a maximum is here at 0, but then we have another maximum at 2 pi. We'd have another maximum at 4 pi, so we could keep adding maximums, same way as we can keep adding minimums at pi and at 3 pi, all at negative 1 y value. The zeros for this graph occur at, at pi over 2, and every repetition of pi over 2, that's a pi distance away. We're going to always have a zero there. It ends at 2 pi comma 1, instead of 2 pi comma, comma 0 like sine. The full thing has a domain of all real numbers and a range of negative 1 to 1 inclusive. This symmetry is even, which means I could fold it along the y-axis, and this side of the graph would line, land up exactly on top of that side of the graph. And again, it is bounded above and below, so we just call it bounded. So since these graphs are so similar, there is actually a graphical representation between sine and cosine, and it's going to be a horizontal shift, a translation of 2 pi. So if you look, sine, which sine goes through zero, so this one right here is sine, starts at zero, comma zero. Well, cosine hits, zero, uh, hits its zero two pi degrees later. So the entire graph is just shifted over pi over two, sorry, I think I said two pi earlier, pi over two um, radians, pi over two distance, and then we have the same graph. So they are related, which is pretty cool. Now here's a bunch of new vocabulary that I want you to have in your back pocket. When we talk about the center line, and yes, it's spelled like the British center in your book, so we're going to spell it like the British center. It's halfway between your max and min, but it's a horizontal line, so it's going to be y equal to the midpoint between your maxes and min. This is going to help us find our displacement or our vertical translation. Basically, this is what the whole graph is kind of centered around. If we moved the center line up, the entire graph, the entire wave would shift up. Your general solutions are zeros is what we found for both functions earlier. It's zeros for the whole wave. So it's going to be whatever your x values are plus pi k or k pi because it's going to repeat over and over again. Sine and cosine are periodic functions. That's what we call them. It's any function that repeats over and over again, which is what's going to happen when we look beyond one little section of this wave. And amplitude is the distance from the center line to the maxes and min. It has a formula of absolute value of A, which will be very handy later. So our amplitude is basically how big the wave is compared to the center line. Normally it's 1, between negative 1 and 1, right? So absolute value is 1, absolute value is 1. But we can change the amplitude and make the waves go higher and lower. That's changing, again, the amplitude. Some more vocabulary, you have your period. The period is the time it takes for the wave for the function to repeat. Its formula is 2 pi divided by b. So you look at the same graph right here. This wave will start to repeat once we get here. Well, that means the period is 2 pi from 0 to 2 pi to finish 1 up and down. A phase shift is going to happen when we horizontally translate a graph. So this is a sine function, and since it goes through 0, 0, there's no phase shift. So your c value, which we'll talk about in a second, is 0. Your vertical shift or displacement, displacement's kind of like the real world 
vocabulary for it is the variable D. And again, it affects your center line to move your entire wave up or down. The X increment or X scale, which is what your calculator is calling it, your X scale is the period divided by four. So two pi over four B technically. This helps you with graphing because if you notice at the increment here, which is two pi divided by four, the period divided by four is pi over two. And every pi over two, we have a major point on this graph. At zero, we have zero. At pi over two, we're up at one. At another pi over two, so pi, we're at zero. And then we're at negative one. Then we're back at zero. This will help us with graphing because we're really only gonna need to actually plot the highest maximums, the zeros, and the minimums to be able to draw my curves. And the x increment, which will change based on your period, is gonna help you graph it easier. Now your frequency is one over the period, which means it's a reciprocal of the period, b over two pi. All that the frequency tells you is how often the wave happens compared to the parent function. So something that has high frequency, like a high frequency sound, is gonna have a bunch of waves because there's more waves for every normal two pi. A low frequency is going to have less waves per two pi. So it's a lower sound or a lower frequency. So again, frequency is how often the wave will happen compared to the parent function, 2 pi. Now, all these letters, A, B, and C, are part of transformations of sinusoids, which is the same vocabulary as regular transformations with our vertical stretch and shrink, horizontal stretches and shrinks, horizontal translations. But we also have new vocabulary in regards to sinusoids and the language of sinusoids. The A, yes, it does tell me a vertical stretch and shrink, but it also tells me my amplitude using the absolute value of it. So if it's a reflection over the x-axis, that doesn't affect the amplitude at all. The period is 2 pi over b, so this b value is going to help me know what the period is. Same way as it's going to help me know the vertical stretch and shrink. Plusing or minusing a number c in the inside of the function is going to tell me the phase shift. It's going to affect the starting value. That's my horizontal translation. And then adding or subtracting numbers at the end is my vertical shift or displacement, which affects the center line. That's our vertical translation. So we're going to put all of these things together to graph a function. Now, in most of the functions that you're going to be graphing, I will ask for you to graph it either from 0 to 2 pi or from negative 2 pi to 2 pi, which means when we graph this function, we want our window to show up from negative 2 pi to 2 pi. Okay, so let's look at this function. Uh, first things first, we need to talk about what the a, b, and c value is. Well, a is 2, b is 1, c is 0, and d is 0. So I have no displacement and no phase shift, but I do have an amplitude of 2 and a period of 2 pi meaning that the x increment that I want to use for this particular function is 2 pi divided by 4, that's pi over 2. My x increment is going to be how I want to label my tick marks. My x increment is pi over 2. So 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and 4 pi over 2. Negative 2 pi over 2 sorry, 1 pi over 2, negative 2 pi over 2, and negative 3 pi over 2. That's my x increment. We have to also label our y-axis, so I know that this is going to go up to the value of 2 instead of to 1, and then down to the value of negative 2. Okay, the x increment tells me either the zeros or the maxes and mins. So I only have to plot points on the x-axis and up at the maximum and down at the minimum. Since this is a sine function, we're going to begin at 0. And sine starts by going up to the maximum, back to the 0. Down to the minimum, back to the 0. And I only have to plot those points because I know that's my zeros or my maxes and mins. That's what's, what the x increment tells me. Now I can go the opposite way, just continuing this wave so that when I connect all of my dots together, my pen stopped working. I have a sine curve. 
Now we double check a few things when we do this. Is my amplitude two? Yeah, every single time my maximum or my minimum goes all the way to two or negative two because it's the distance. And is the period of this function, is one full wave two pi distance? It is. So we have correctly graphed this two sine of x function. Now here's a fully worked out example. This one is gonna be a horizontal shrink by a half, which just means that we're gonna take the cosine function and have a higher frequency, which means it's going to show up or wave twice for every one period. This has an amplitude of one, a B value of two, no C value because it's plus zero and no D value because it's plus zero. So my center line didn't move and I haven't shifted it phase wise. The amplitude is 1, the period is 2 pi divided by 2, so that's pi, and my x increment for this one is going to be pi divided by 4, which is pi over 4. So every tick mark that I make is no longer pi over 2, it's pi over 4. 1 pi over 4, 2 pi's over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4, and that is one period. So you see my cosine function starts at 1 and gets back to 1 within that one blue period. We just have to repeat it since we're going from negative 2 to 2 multiple times. Again, my x increment is either the maximum, the 0, or the minimum when I'm plotting points. That's why we have the x increment because it helps me figure out how often I need to put a coordinate point on my graph. Um, we've got another example here. You can kind of look through it. This has a longer period, a period of 4 pi. So if I only actually drew this from negative 2 pi to 2 pi, it would only be this purple area here. But for the sake of actually graphing it correctly, I went from negative 4 pi to 4 pi, just so you could see that an entire period of this function, of this cosine function, is from 0 to 4 pi. That's when we start and finish. Now this one starts at negative one because it is a reflection in the x-axis. My amplitude is still one, but I'm gonna begin by reflecting the graph over the x-axis since that's what the transformation tells me to do. Now we'll do this one. Uh, this is a vertical stretch by a factor of three, which means my amplitude is three. The B value, since this is a horizontal shrink by a half, is two which means that the period is 2 pi divided by 2, or pi. And my x, oh sorry, c is 0 and d is 0 because we're not doing a phase shift left or right or a vertical displacement up or down. My x increment is going to be the period divided by 4. So the period is pi divided by 4. Okay, that's going to tell me where to lay out all of my coordinate points between negative 2 pi and 2 pi so that I can have easy, easily graphed numbers. So I have 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 6 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4, 8 pi over 4. And then repeat the other way. Negative pi over 4, negative 2 pi over 4, negative 3 pi over 4, negative 4 pi over 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, negative 8 pi over 4. Yes, you can label all those little tick marks if you'd like. In fact, just so you remember what we're counting by, we'll label the first one, but you can count after that. Now, my amplitude for this graph is 3, which means I'm going to have to go up 1, 2, 3, down 1, 2, 3, to be able to find all of my maximum and minimum values. This is sine. Sine starts at 0. Every tick mark that you've put on there in the x increment is either a maximum, minimum, or zero. So we have a zero, then a max, then a zero, then a min, then a zero, then a max, then a zero, then a min, then a zero. Go the other way. Zero, minimum, zero, maximum, zero, minimum, zero, maximum, zero. Okay, we can play connect the dots. Ooh, I kind of missed a few dots, but you can imagine that that looks a lot better than it does. So here is a vertically stretched, so got taller and lower by three, and a horizontal shrink. So we've coiled it up, we've shrunk it in, 
so that more frequently a whole wave is happening. Notice still that my period, a full repeat from zero to zero is pi, that's the period, and my amplitude is three, so that makes sense. Um, you can look at this example. It's basically working backwards. If I tell you the amplitude and the period, you can set up a proportion and solve for B um, and also find the amplitude to be able to write functions. But this one we're going to do out. So if we look at the graph, we're going to want to be able to pull A, B, C, and D and what type of function it is from the picture, from the graph itself. First things first, is this sine or cosine? If I tell you that there's no phase shift, I'm going to give you that information, which means we not moved it side to side, this graph starts at zero. And since it starts at zero, that means it's a sine function. Cool. What is the amplitude? Well, the amplitude is 0 0.5, so that means my a value is a half. And I know that this is a positive a value because we're not starting going to the negative number first, we're starting going to the positive number. B affects my period. And it takes a full 8 pi for me to finish one wave of this function. So 8 pi is going to be equal to the formula for period, which includes b. And I can set myself up a nice little proportion, cross multiply butterfly method, to solve that b is going to be equal to a fourth. Okay, and since my center line of this graph also didn't move off of the x-axis, I guess we really should have looked at that first, I have no vertical displacement. So my formula here is going to be y equal to the amplitude times the sine function that we know it is, multiplying a one-fourth on the inside. Since this is a vertical stretch, or sorry, horizontal stretch, we've widened the coil, widened the wave, it's going to be one-fourth on the inside. Now this is the last example we're going to do together. Notice that this time when I'm asking you to graph, I'm only asking you to graph from 0 to 2 pi. So sometimes it's from negative 2 pi to 2 pi, but in this case it's 0 to 2 pi. All right, let's check this. So we have an amplitude of, or an a value of negative 4, which means my amplitude is just 4. We have a b value of 1, which means by frequency, 2 pi divided by b is just going to be 2 pi. There's no phase shift, but there is a vertical displacement. So no phase shift, but there is a vertical displacement of 2, which means I automatically know that my center line is going to be moved up 2 units. That's where all of my zeros, I'm using air quotes, all of my zeros, they're not zeros anymore, but the numbers we've been using as zeros on the center line, will go. My x increment is going to be the period divided by 4, so my x increment is pi over 2. So if I were drawing the x increment in, here's 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2. Okay, now we know that the amplitude of this function is 4, so I need to count up 4 from the center line. One, two, three, four. That's going to be the maximum of my graph, which is actually at six, since this is two. And my minimum is going to be four below that. One, two, three, four at negative two. Because we've shifted this up, we've displaced it up. But after I have all that labeled, I can just follow the same pattern. Sine starts at zero, and I'm using air quotes when I say the word zero, because my zero, or my home button, my home coordinate, has been shifted up two times. So that's my zero, air quotes. But then we are reflecting this, so we're going to go down first, then back to my zero, then up to my maximum, and then back to my zero. So my sine wave is a reflection, that's why I went downwards first, between zero and two pi. Notice again, my period is 2 pi, that makes sense, and my amplitude is still 4 both directions. We've just displaced it up, moved the whole wave up. There are a few more examples on the next slides that you're going to see. I'm not going to have a voice on them that you can read through. The last one is a word problem. Don't really worry about it. It's just a cool example of when we would use this in real life for waves.